This is the detailed version of my rotary brooch build. Click the card to see the cinematic version. The whole purpose of a rotary brooch is to enable you to cut a hex or a square into an existing hole. The way this tool works, this spinning brooch bit is kicked off from the axis of the machine and this enables the cutting action. So in my design here, I've got this back plate which sets the angle of the tool, the body which simply houses the bearings, and then we've got the spindle here which is also the brooch holder. Apart from our brooch tools, there's really only three parts we need to make. Let's start off with this back plate. I've skimmed off the surface rust, now to turn the shank. I've sized this shank to be the largest size that will fit inside my tailstock. I scrubbed a line with my lathe tool, just so I've got a bit of a guide in the bandsaw. I'm now cutting a divot in the back plate. This divot is to allow a bit more clearance on the spindle, and this makes the tool more compact and shortens it overall. Remember how we need to kick this tool off at a slight angle? This is how we'll achieve it. These holes don't need to be perfect. There's matching oversized holes in the body and this lets me dial in the tool to dead center. We'll go over that later. Now we'll have a look at this body. There's gonna be some interesting measuring techniques in here. Now I've got to bore this to a certain depth, so I'll show you my setup for that. I've made sure to tram the compound in reasonably well. I don't have a DRO on my lathe, and to make sure I don't overshoot, this is my technique for internal boring. Wind your compound all the way forward. Using your dial, wind back the required amount, but make sure you take out the backlash. Winding the carriage forward, touch off with your tool on the face of the workpiece. Now that you've touched off on the face, lock your carriage. Now you can perform all your boring using the compound because when you wind in, you're going to have a physical stop at the end of your travel. So you can't possibly overshoot your measurement and if you trust your dials, technically you don't need to do any measuring. One thing to note with this technique, if your compound isn't perfectly trammed, you're going to be cutting an internal taper. So do most of your roughing with your compound and then wind with your carriage for the final few passes. And that way you know you're getting a parallel bore. My lathe and dividing head have the same spindle thread. So I'm able to swap chucks over and keep the concentricity. I'm now going to use a ball end mill to put in ornamental grooves. I put consideration into the tool stick out here. I needed to make sure they'd be able to clear the chuck jaws and it just worked. I don't like the sharp transition here in this area, so I'm going to get creative. I was able to peck with a ball end mill to improve the transition here and I'm quite happy with the result. My mill's actually fairly small, so to get the clearance for drilling, I'm going to turn the head sideways. And I figured why not use the dividing head while it's already set up. Caught nut's going to hit. I've got just the thing for this. It's just Morse type of collets, guys. This whole setup came with this mill. I've never actually used it myself. So these are actually Morse type of 2 collets. They go into Morse type of 2 to 3 adapter. Let's buck this off at the bandsaw. Now I haven't made up proper soft jaws, so I'm just going to use some aluminium. Now I just need to bore out for the rear bearing, and this body will be done. Over at the surface plate, we've got some interesting metrology issues to sort out in my workshop. This bearing is spec to 28mm on the outside. The largest micrometer I've got is only a 25mm. So that's a problem when using a telescoping gauge. There's another issue. This bearing, that is spec to 26 nominal, this bearing is actually 26.07. Now it might be because I'm running at the maximum travel of this micrometer and technically it's beyond the 25. That's quite a long way out, but that's not the problem. And it doesn't matter what the mic actually reads, whether this is calibrated or not, because I'm measuring the bearing and I'm measuring the telescoping gauge with the same micrometer. I've got to measure this one, which is 28. I haven't got a way of measuring this, so to measure this bearing, I'm using my height gauge and a dial test indicator. So that's zeroed there on the crest. In order to transfer measurements from my board, I'm going to be using a telescoping gauge. What I aim to do, because I don't have a micrometer in this size, 
is to wiggle it under here and get a reading between the table and the needle there. One thing about measuring like this, I haven't got the distance to go that I have with a micrometer. I've got no idea how much more I need to go. So if I use a gauge block, I can work out how much I've got left. I've got to get it right on the crest of that sphere. I was so caught up over at the surface plate, I lost count of where my dial was at. About a quarter of a mil oversized on the diameter at the moment. I'll bore this out bigger, press the sleeve in, bore that sleeve to size, and then we'll fit our bearing. Okay, so there's two things I'm going to do. A ring of center punches through here. That'll give it a bit more of a mechanical bite. And then I'm going to lock tight it. The reason why I'm doing both, once I get this ring down, there's going to be very little meat in this wall and it's going to want to warp and deflect. So I'm going to need everything I can in order to get this board to hold. It's not great because I'm smacking up my spindle bearings, but let's apply what we can where we can. That's pretty much wall to wall. I'm pretty confident I can push that in. So I managed to hide the sleeve just by adding a heavy chamfer on there, which is gonna be good to push the bearing in as well. Now to make the spindle. I made the spindle step so it would fit through each row of bearings easier. It's very critical that the depth of this hole is very accurate. I need to measure how deep I'm drilling. And we'll use this gauge block as a distance to go. Over at the surface grind, it's now time to grind our tools. I plan on using a dividing head in order to grind the hex shape. Back to our friends, the Morse taper collet. I've used it twice on this project. I like to make this spindle tube extender and that works quite nice. Dunk. Now this tool stick out is absolutely ridiculous. Now I do have this cutoff wheel for the surface grinder and I'd love to use that to part off my tools, but I have to make up a whole heap of wheel hub adapters and I'm sort of waiting for the right time to just batch them all out. So we've got our little puck we we'll insert that into the back of the collet and then insert our high speed steel. Now because these are both 10 mil and I've checked them, we should be fine, it should get equal clamping across the length. Okay, got my first victim prepared. This is actually a broken end mill shank, so I haven't got the clearance to angle the head up too much more. That's fine. What I'll do for this next operation is move the dividing head. I'm just gonna cut myself off here and fast forward through all this. My intention was to use the surface grinder to dish out the front of the tools but the wheel diameter is far too large and the surface pretty much ended up being flat. I managed to dish the front on the lathe using a Dremel. Now to cut the relief. I was taking it fairly easy because I didn't want to rough off too much at a time and I didn't want to overshoot my measurement. I'm happy with the result and the tool seems sharp. Now to push our bearings in. I got the bearing fits fairly nice and they went together with very little effort. And now to put it all together. I didn't really show up but there's a circlip to retain the spindle. I dialed the tip of the tool on center and then locked tight of the alignment screws. Before we use the tool, let's have a look at how it actually works. Pretend this hex is the rotary brooch. The workpiece is spinning. When the first cutting edge of the rotary brooch makes contact, it grabs and gets dragged along. And due to the off axis nature of the rotary brooch, it'll spin. That first tooth is gonna to start disengaging and the second tooth is gonna engage. And this will keep happening all the way through. So it almost works like a set of bevel gears in the way it works. Now if you were to change the axis of this and keep the workpiece stationary and instead move the tool, it forms this sort of action. And this is why a rotary brooch is sometimes referred to as a wobble brooch, because of this wobbling cutting action. 
Each time one of these teeth contacts the surface, it nibbles a little bit, and that's what actually cuts it. You first need a hole cut in here, and the rotary brooch is not designed to hog out lots of material. It only enlarges and just slightly shapes an existing hole. So that's how it works. Let's try it out. I decided to go easy for the first test, and we've got 12, 14 steel in there. This is an 8mm brooch. Let's see if this works. Wait, that's... Why were we not turning? I didn't add a chamfer. Okay, take two with the chamfer lead in. This goes right... Oh. And that'll do. Okay, that looks weird that we've got two hexes there. That's because I took the tool out, tried to realign it, and obviously didn't align it very well. There's definitely a hex that's cut full depth. Have I actually got my size right? Ooh, maybe a bit tight. Well, it did fit. The problem is it's eight millimeters a bit too perfectly. It needs to be slightly oversized, so it's got to be a clearance. Oh, geez. I did another test, and I think I've got a good result now. You can see where the metal's been mushed up inside it as it's been shaved down the sides. I just need to drill those out. Okay, new brooch tool made up. Okay, let's try this. It's going in. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That is, that is very nice. Yeah, that is very nice. Now you might be wondering how much force does it take to drive this thing? This is an 8mm hex. I'd probably estimate it's about the same as driving this 22mm drill. Well the tool works, and now I can make my own socket head cap screws. Before you go, don't forget to check out the cinematic version. I've also got plans for this tool available. See the link below. I'm also prepared to make the rotary brooch and the tools for sale. If I get enough people interested, I'll make a batch. Let me know. Big thank you to Emma and Steve for putting this competition on and judging it. Catch you later.